Our scripture today is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, and we'll be reading verses 1 through 9. Okay, read along with me. Let's feed ourselves as we read this. Starting at verse 1. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before us like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sour, sorrows, excuse me, and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb, a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living, for the transgressions of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. 
Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. Amen and amen.
Pray with me at this somber moment. Jesus, Son of God, this day is, is a, a dreary, hard day. And as your children, we put ourselves there and think about how horrible and tragic and all the confusion in our minds that our Savior, Jesus, has been crucified. That's not how it was supposed to go. That's not what we thought, Lord. We didn't understand. Our hearts are broken, Lord. We hate to see you there and suffer. So, Father, hear our prayers. Hear our brokenness. Our brokenness that can only be mended by the blood of Jesus. Hear us this day, Lord. We praise your holy name. Amen. Today, our scripture is from the book of Luke. We're going to be reading verses 26 uh, in chapter 23, and then verses 32 through 43. Please get your uh, Bibles and read with me. It's important not only to hear the word, but to see it. And to be honest, Sometimes when I pray, I will put my finger on a verse and pray. So here we are, verse 26. And as they led him away, they seized Simon of Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put him on the cross and made him carry it behind Jesus. And now chapter 23, starting at verse 32. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even snared at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, the Chosen One. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was written a notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said? Since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. Put that in your hearts just now and let it simmer. Amen.
always drawn to this part of the story. Jesus, the prophesied one, had come and as was foretold, was, was rejected. Rejected by the Jews. In fact, traded, right, for a killer, Barabbas. How low, we might think today, must a society sink, even if you didn't agree with the teachings of Jesus, to offer him up and what he stood for, instead of a known convicted killer. <clears throat> so they beat him to within an inch of his life, as was the way, and then they strap his cross, or part of it, across his back and make him carry it. And they make him carry it to the place of death if you're one of the soldiers, or if you're one of the religious leaders of the time, or maybe if you're one of the people in the crowd laughing and jeering and spitting and cussing at him. But here's the thing. To Jesus, in spite of all that, and in, in, in spite of the outward pain, the torture, he wasn't toting this lumber to a place of death at all, was he? No, he, he, he was bringing it along with all the profane words, along with the spit, yeah, along with all the agony and the jealousy, the envy of the leaders, along with every prideful, hurtful, ugly thing that I or we have ever said or done or maybe will do, he was actually bringing that, all of that, to a place of offering. <laughs> so many pictures of Christ in the Old Testament. One of these is found in Genesis, the 22nd chapter. Abraham, after all of these years of waiting for a son, after receiving the covenantal promises from God himself, after, as is our way, by the way, after getting impatient with God, anybody, and taking matters into his own hands, you know the story with Hagar in, in Genesis 16, he finally receives his long-awaited son at the age of 100 only to have God tell him, take your son, your only son, that is to say the son of the promise, not the son of his hasty actions. The son, your only son, son who you love and go to the region of Moriah and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering. Now here's the crazy part, at least to me. The next verse, the very next verse, says this, says, early in the next morning, Abraham got up and did what he was told. <laughs> he just got up and, and did what God, no, no arguing, no bickering, no questioning. Then it says, Abraham took the wood, right, placed it on his son Isaac to carry. Next comes, at least to me, one of what I think is one of, if not the most gut-wrenching verses in all of Scripture. It's where Isaac says, Father, the fire and the wood, we have all that, but where is the lamb for the offering? I can't. As a father, that's a hard one to, to chew on for a while. But Abraham, I believe, full of faith, he replies, God himself will provide the lamb. Now, we know at just the right time, having seen real faith, total faith, complete faith, might we even say barbaric faith, God did indeed provide the necessary lamb, and Isaac was spared. Centuries later, in the fullness of time, Galatians says, the right time, just to say, when God saw fit and best, in spite of all of our wonderings, our questions, our ideas, our doubts, God sent his one and only son, whom he loved, the spotless lamb who takes away the sin of the world, born of a woman and under the law. And he brought him to redeem, to save, to pull us off, out, every one of us out of the misery that Satan wants to throw on us. And sure enough, as we're told by the prophet Isaiah, he was despised and rejected. And so, having been traded for a criminal by the very ones he came to save, he carries this cumbersome wood, think of Isaac, blood gushing from, well, everywhere, 
until he can carry it no longer. And at this point of the story, we're introduced to Simon, Simon of Cyrene from over in Africa. Now, Simon is there simply because it's Passover time. And how great is that, right? Passover time. The Savior is here. He's there to worship at the temple to carry out the expectations of the law as he understood them. That's very important. He's there to carry out the expectations of the law as he understood them. And as he meandered his way through the crowds, he's caught up in all of the craziness surrounding Jesus. Now, all of a sudden, a Roman centurion is staring him down, yelling at him commanding him not just to get out of the way or help in some menial way, no, but to actually help Jesus, this criminal, carry his own cross. As a matter of fact, in Mark's account of this story, the words that, that, are, that are used there imply that Simon not only had to bear the weight of the cross, but also bear the weight of Jesus himself. Life is full of unexpected crosses. I think we'd all agree. Maybe it's a job, a job lost, maybe a loved one lost. Maybe it's a virus that basically brings a country, possibly even a world, to its knees. Now, now we don't want these crosses. Simon didn't want it. We certainly don't ask for them. Simon didn't ask for them. They're not comfortable, nor are they easy. They're hard, they're painful, they're heavy. They beat us down and they beat us up. But you see, I believe, as do many, many folks that I read, I believe that an amazing thing happened in that moment, that horrifyingly beautiful moment when Simon met Jesus. See, I believe he understood this to be the very one the law he had come to simply adhere to spoke about. I believe when he was pushed down onto and alongside Jesus, I believe they looked into each other's eyes and he knew. I believe the blood of Jesus Christ spilled onto him and he knew. Because that's what looking into the eyes, fixing our eyes on Jesus does. That's what the blood of Jesus is all about. Taking what was lost, even though well-meaning, making it found. Taking what was good, the law, our, our concept of it, and making it perfect in and through and just as it was for Simon, the opportunity exists for each one of us. Good Friday is a horrible yet wonderful day all sort of rolled into one. As you consider him, the one who for the joy set before him endured the cross, maybe take a moment and consider Simon. His sons are mentioned prominently in the New Testament. It's believed they were instrumental in the spreading of the gospel. I'm wondering why or how that came to be. Could it be because of this moment we talk about today? Could it be because of this look between him and the Savior? Or the touch of him and the Savior? Think about your cross or crosses. Think about Simon. Think about our Savior. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this world will grow strangely, strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace.